in search of soil. One thing I want to start on today was carbon sequestration. How do you view carbon sequestration when it comes to soil? So, yes, carbon sequestration is a, a pretty hot topic. and It's covered in the media extensively, and, and we should ask why, why is it that? Um, I would say um, a soil with no carbon is, is like a body with no soul. It's, it's just basically the life uh, of, uh, of the soil. And the goal is to sequester carbon, which meaning, you know, taking it from the atmosphere through the process of photosynthesis. You know, as you know, we convert the energy from the sun into carbon and carbon is uh, sequestered to, uh, from, by the plants and is accumulated in the soil in two ways. One is by having roots growing in the soil, that's organic compounds, organic materials, they stay in the soil. And at the end of uh, the growing cycle, when you have anything that we call, you know, stove residues, you obviously want to keep them in the ground because that's carbon that was sequestered from the atmosphere. And so carbon is sequestered by accumulating carbon, by putting carbon in the soil. Uh, carbon is not generated automatically. It's actually lost from the soil as a process of microbial decomposition. So if that provides a general you know, ground to... to um, for, for, uh, for you to understand, carbon is critical because it has so many positive um, aspects. And so I'll, I'll leave it there for now that, that again, the goal is trying to keep as much carbon in the soil because think of carbon as a health uh, source of check. If you have carbon in the soil, you more on the healthy side. If you have less carbon in the soil, you may be running into potential problem. Obviously, depends on the type of systems and, and um, the type of management that you do. You can certainly compensate a lot of uh, the, the negativity of not having carbon through management. So if carbon, as, as we may continue in, in this conversation on carbon, it helps retaining water. And what could it be if you don't have carbon, you irrigate? but you may not be able to do that. It may, there is cost involved and there is energy involved and there is a strong component. So if that helps, uh, that's, that's generally my view. You do want to sequester as much carbon as possible. And because you don't control, you control partially the way the plants grow through the management, you want to accumulate the roots, but the critical piece is adding carbon to the soil in, in many different ways. Do you have a sense in a natural system, a, say a healthy ecosystem that is just out there, a, um, a meadow, a prairie, a forest, is there an average net gain or loss in carbon to the soil? So plants are using carbon out of the atmosphere and they're putting some of that into the soil. The microbes are respiring it. They're putting out oxygen. The plants are putting out oxygen in the process. At the end of the day, if you put that system in a vacuum, does it balance itself out where if one unit of carbon comes out of the atmosphere, one ends up in the soil? Yes, very, very good question. I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible. Imagine the prairies, you know, imagine virgin land with vegetation, like you said, that that's, um, has already at a level of carbon that has a mineral soils may be at saturation, so is in balance. Whatever, you know, through the winter plants die, they grow back, they sequester as much as is lost if they are at saturation. Saturation means roughly about 5% of the soil organic carbon that can be stored. So prairies don't, don't ever go to 15, 20%, 30%. Those, that's a very difficult. Sometimes I even hear, oh, my soil organic carbon is going to 20%. That's a little bit different. You have an organic matter compound, but you really, we're talking about soil carbon, soil carbon that remains in the soil that brings all the positive aspects. Now, 
if you are not a saturation, see it as a bucket. If you see that and, and you tilled, you, you basically have done something to that land, imagine that land as a jar. If you open that jar, there it goes a big flush of CO2, carbon dioxide, as a result of this respiration from microbes that goes into the atmosphere. So if the bucket now is just basically you lost, imagine drinking out of a bucket, you lower. Now you have a gap and that could be regained. So in the accumulation now of doing photosynthesis and, and basically uh, accumulating roots and now you slowly building back up because you are now you have a room for it. The problem in the managed system you keep it bringing it down. You keep drinking out of this bucket that you really have little left, but much greater potential to accumulate. The problem is what do we do? We put some, we take out. We take as much or more. And so it's this continuous fluctuation. And, and that's why I needed to start for you to understand that, that the, the example that you started with starts possibly at a saturation and not much more can be gained. But in general, yes, it can be sequestered compared to the amount of what is lost through respiration. And how can it be? By don't touch it, don't touch the soil. If you touch the soil, you break the aggregates. And what happens if you break the aggregate? You basically open the jar. You basically open the, that aggregate of soil that is exposed to soil microbes that they made out of carbon, they eat carbon and they expel carbon. That's basically what they are. And so this in form of CO2 gets released into the atmosphere. What we accumulate through virtues, uh, virtual, you know, good uh, practices like no tillage or cover crop, it really depends on where you are in the level of degradation. If you have room to accumulate, you should do so and maintain it. Unfortunately, as soon as you break this virtuous cycle and you till or you remove, uh, basically you don't continue doing that, then you start basically dipping in, uh, almost seeing as a bank account. You know, you accumulate, um, but if you keep drawing out more than you put in, then you start losing. So I don't know if I was, I was clear, but it's, it's, again, the complexity stays on where are you at in terms of your potential? Can you sequester it? And are you keeping it for a long time? Because this accumulation, we're talking, I don't necessarily want to give you numbers that people may not relate, but a cover crop could sequester, you know, basically, you know, one, one ton of, of carbon. And depending on the volume and the bulk density of the soil and where you start, it will make a very little then. It'll be like 1.01 now, and it keeps slowly. So it takes long time to accumulate carbon. And at some point in the conversation, Diego, I think we should address why it's important. We said it obviously, yes, it is the life, but it has so many positive aspects in addition to the climate benefits. The climate benefit meaning of we're all aware of uh, CO2 being much and a greater uh, um, concentration than before. Simply put that we had, how many more cars do we have compared to 50 years ago? That's petrol that was in the bowel of the earth, there was carbon in the bowel of the earth, and now we put it into the atmosphere. So re that remains a, a strong, uh, the stronger sector. But agriculture plays a role and I, I see it as a solution rather than uh, a, um, you know, the problem, even though we do contribute roughly in the range that, the, you know, uh, ranges uh, that between 12, 14 or so, 15% of the anthropogenic CO2 is emitted comes from agriculture. And the majority of that comes from N2O. We probably will get there in the conversation about abatement. But let me just uh, add the positive aspect to that if you retain carbon, because carbon creates a glue, like a, a, a physical glue uh, that the aggregates are glued together, when water goes in that, it retains, it stays there much longer. The microbes basically can't go in, 
but the roots can slowly and be able to use this water when it's needed. So first benefit, a greater capacity of holding water for longer time. And that's, that's critical because it helps stabilize yields, especially in an environment where water may be you know, more, more limiting. As this is the carbon of microbes, they still decompose, there is a release of nutrients that is also you know, very, uh, very important in terms of adjusting the possible management that you will add on with fertilizer, which could be less if you have higher organic matter and the decomposition allows the release of nitrogen. So they're both properties uh, physical uh, in terms of, again, retaining more water, chemical, Cation exchange capacity, more nutrients can be um, ex and, you know, used by the roots and, uh, and then biological because it increases the activity, the presence of microbes, which uh, have a very strong positive effect on the overall health of the plants. What, what constitutes carbon saturation in the soil? Is that a property of the the ma the mineral makeup of that soil, so you know, sand, silt, clay, that is, and yes, indeed. It, okay, and then when it gets to that saturation point, let's say I have soil X, it's at saturation. Like I I can't put more carbon into the soil at that point. Does that mean? Does that somehow affect the evolution of plant life above it? Meaning, if they were producing one point one units of carbon and they needed one. Soil can't absorb that extra 0.1. Where is that one going? Or are, are plants dying off to basically say, okay, we need to deplete carbon in the soil? So you, you frame it correctly that the, the, that upper threshold, it is set by the physical properties. So a soil is composed by about, you know, 25% water, 5% carbon, and, and the rest is mineral. Okay, so percentage between uh, sand, silt, and clay. So when you are at that level of roughly in, in fact, they're called mineral soils. We can go to the istosols, soils, the organic, the PT, peat soils, where they can go 50% carbon, but they become, that's like a mine territory because if you put them and you just almost look at them by scratching, who big release of CO2? Um, they go. So they can be mitigated and there can be things done to them, but they are so um, on a very small percentage of areas that they're not going to be a critical uh, piece uh, in the future. But so this, the, um, the mineral soils, once they reach this, yes, vegetation is, but the vegetation, what you didn't um, necessarily, plants build carbon from the atmosphere. So that carbon, it's, it's, not, it's not used. It's, if you don't till it, it remains the way it is. So roots grow, die off, and nothing changes. So it's at equilibrium. There is no extra. If you put a big uh, a change vegetation, the thing is change of vegetation requires some change of a physical change. You gotta, so if it is a natural change that you know, wind brings a different, that's more a climate related, what temperature. And in the prairies, there are, there is a, uh, basically an evolution of which species predominates, you know, the grass is over. And that's very important to maintain um, the, the, you know, the biodiversity for the benefits of the microbes. But when you are in situation of um, saturation, you will very well confirm that uh, the prairies wouldn't change. In terms so they're, of, they're balancing themselves out, they're in equilibrium. They're balancing themselves out. The, the roots that die, they get, you know, uh, rebuilt, and that number does not change. So th thinking about that in a cultivation sense, now we move to man coming in here. Exactly. And you have a grower. Let's say their, car let's say their soils were at carbon saturation due to just good growing practices, whatever that means. And they start adding additional organic matter to the soil surface, compost, manures, some sort of organic mulch. If the soil's already at carbon saturation, you're adding all this new carbon to the soil, what, what, what happens? 
it basically it's it's lost. It reaches the term the term carbon is the element of carbon. It, it remains at that percent. It remains if it is a mineral soils, you would increase the organic matter. You know, you could have. I mean, think of a big pile of manure. That's much greater percentage of you know uh, organic compounds, but it's different than the, the the organic carbon as an element that we're saying. The reason there is not necessarily to worry about that problem. It's a good problem to have because five percent organic matter. I mean, five percent carbon is ten percent organic matter. Okay, there is difference between carbon is organic matter is fifty eight percent carbon. So we're already looking at a 10% organic matter not being in organic soils and easter soils, hard to see. If you go to the thumb in, in Michigan, where I'm located, those are 15, 20% organic, but those are PD soils. Those are, those are easter soils. They're very different mineral compositions, totally different individual, totally different beast. So it's not a problem that we, we really face or we worry about, oh, I don't want, you far from having 5% organic carbon, which means, you know, 10, 12% organic matter. You, you will need to keep adding nutrients, I mean, um, uh, amendments in the form of carbon to be able to reach as close as possible. The secret, Diego, is that the, the, the main issue of what we may do a good job is that we often lose that carbon by opening the jar. And that's very hard to, to comprehend in terms of saying, well, I have to, I'm a vegetable grower. You have to fully understand. If you don't produce vegetable, we, we won't be healthy in terms. So there is always a trade-off. There, is, there shouldn't be fanaticism about things. Yes, you do want to reach that. You don't want to have a total, what we call soil inversion tillage where you flip, you know, marble plow, you basically remove, you just flip 30 centimeters, you know, a foot of soil upside down, bringing all the microbes, the activity as, you know, it used to be in the past. So the more heavy source of tillage. If you scrape the surface and you, you basically, your damage in terms of carbon losses is mitigated. And it's not very much in terms of losses because you can compensate by having graded yield and, and accumulation of roots and uh, uh, adding compounds and because you want to build that soil organic carbon for all the benefits that we just said, be able to hold water, be able to release nutrients, have healthy soil. It's just the synonym of a healthy situation if you have that carbon. No, one thing I don't want to get lost in is, is data at the expense of reality here. So 5% carbon saturation point, like that sounds great. You know, you're up at high organic matter content. Does that m translate for a, for a grower to mean that if you had 5% carbon where you're saturated in carbon, that you would have better plant growth versus if you had say 2.5% carbon? Is that a fair assumption? Like is more carbon, meaning the plants that I'm growing are probably growing to be more healthy? That's a very good, very good question, Diego. The, the answer will be probably not as much unless you have a particular situation in terms of climate. Okay, so if you are on a, on a relatively good year, if we're talking about California and you obviously regate you wouldn't because you're compensating for that additionality of water storage that you will get from the soil organic carbons. And then it will make a big difference if you have the, the high organic. But on, let, let's say, a, a vegetable growers in the Midwest that has a relatively good soil, 2% and under uh, a, a conditions of, you know, good distribution of rainfall, it just is, it's, that that additional carbon and, and water storage is a stabilizer for situation. When does for, for situation they're more vulnerable? When does no tillage? If you hear the in in, in the literature, is this when does no tillage really makes a difference in the dry years? Understand. So it is that situation. 
it's it's hard to put it in in frame you know how much yield increase would i get almost nothing if it's su sufficiently uh, rainfall w would you still compensate with some manure or some additional nutrients then suddenly no difference you you leave that soil alone you don't touch you don't put rainfall you don't do anything if it is a dry year big difference five percent wins if it is a normal year and a relatively good distribution of rainfall and so on possibly not a huge difference but um i hope i uh, make the, the main uh, it's in the dry in the more difficult situation what about in terms of microbiology you know you or me um there's there's 10 pizzas there and there's five pizzas, you know, five pizzas is great, but man, if there's 10 to choose from, whoa, like we can really pig out and go nuts. Is is it fair to say microbial life would behave differently at a higher percentage? Spot on, spot on. But the, 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 the question you asked earlier was immediate change in, uh, in a yearly in terms of yields. No, if on a long term, a 5% is it's a hundred pizza to choose from it's like 10 menus of 10 restaurants to choose from versus a much smaller we have experience and data from the kellogg biological station at michigan state university that has a long-term site basically the no tillage is has been accumulating carbon slowly going up but we're still talking in the range of you know 1.5 2 percent but the amount of microbial activity and the biodiversity that is present in plots where, you know, greater biodiversity of plants, you know, even different, the microbiomes on plants, we are finding to be extremely important. That brings eventually a conversation that we may touch on, on rotations, you know, the possibility of changing the type of vegetation that you have in the soil. That's extremely so. To, to provide again the final answer to your question, yes, much broader possibility of having the the strong guy, the short guy, the the the, the fastest, and all the possible qualities of these microbes be able to satisfy, you know, bringing the nutrients, holding the water versus more of a limited uh, pool. But you, you play with what you have, but you you identify correctly that the winner it's in the ex uh, expanded portfolio of microbes and bio uh, micro uh, yeah microbiomes you know through a lot of the work that you've done uh, let's say well we know a lot of cultivated soils are degenerative and, and they're they're low on that carbon saturation point are there specific plants or crops that are net carbon sequesterers like they are going to end up putting more in than they take out at the end of the day okay uh so that question like uh like uh, the the complexity behind it it depends on if you if you isolate a plant by itself without management associated with it is one story if you manage, so the example that obviously comes natural would be a corn plant, right? You know, a corn versus a native uh, a sweet grass or a native a mix of native vegetation. Now, corn, if it is managed properly, can reach a significant amount of biomass that is accumulated, and it's still one of the king of the crops. It it, re, it sequesters more carbon that a forest at saturation because you will only saturation meaning that has already growth but even nearly when you accumulate the woods what does the forest brings in terms of sequestering the leaves then the leaves come so that's to to put it in numbers a forest sequest about eight tons and a corn crop on average will be at least 20 tons but is it a net no because corn uses fertilizer and then that, that goes down the drain already, the emissions and all the life cycle analysis, and we can go there. The perennials, we have, for example, one crop, Miscanthus gigantus. I don't know if you heard, it's one of the bio, new bioenergy cellulosic crop. The, the, the yield is 50 tons, okay, naturally. So no fertilizer, 
it fixes somehow, it just does independent. So, and the amount of roots and rhizobium that it accumulates is massive. So that will go, the problem with Miscanthus is that can be an invasive species. And so DOE, the Department of Energy that has funded um, the bioenergy centers across, across the nations has almost allocated University of Illinois is looking at Miscanthus, Michigan State and University of Wisconsin are looking at switchgrass that has much more of a broad range of uh, possibility of growing, but switchgrass on average would accumulate about eight tons of, of biomass. So those are the natural behavior to answer your question. Yeah, big differences in plant. Wheat is five tons maximum, and half of that will be, you know, could be grains. And so I'm talking about in general, average total, um, and the primary productivity of that particular crop. But I want to spend a minute on saying that people may not realize that nowadays the level of photosynthesis done through two things, improved genetics and management, basically spoon feeding a crop, we have reached the level of yield of corn of 600 bushels. So the average national is 170 bushels and world record for the last four or five years has been in the range of close to uh, 580, 50 and, and 600, the last one, 615 actually, which when you convert it into total biomass, we're talking about now 50 uh, tons per hectare. But the amount of, that's very positive emitter because of the amount of, uh, uh, it doesn't accumulate carbon in it per se because of the balances through the amount of inputs that they are used. As I initially said, Diego, with agriculture being an anthropogenic uh, component to the climate, is through fertilizer addition, we lose 50% of uh, the gr greenhouse gas emissions coming from agriculture come from N2O emissions, okay? And so that's another balance because even the potential of total accumulation of carbon is still requires nitrogen to go with it. There is a CN ratio. So you will always be depleted by nitrogen unless you add fertilizer. So if you want to fill all the soils with 5% in the globe, it will be equivalent to have 75% of the fertilizer production that we currently have in the world, which is really, really heavy sorts of emissions. Now, that doesn't mean that that fertilizer has to come from synthetic fertilizer. There are legumes that, that can be you know, produced. So if we want to come back to the species, yes, different species have different capacity, have different photosynthetic capacity and rates of accumulating carbon per unit area. The amount of this carbon, remember there is a component above the plant, but there is also roots. So there is this root shoot uh, composition that actually in situation where water is not available, roots become deeper. And so they, they deal, basically the plants provide these feedback mechanisms of saying, okay, the root says, I'm um, uh, there is actually a simple way to think that if plant is exposed to a stress and the stress comes from above, what would be a stress coming from above? Reduced light, right? You know, shading from, then the, the, all the synthetic, the, the assimilates will go to the top and the plants will try to go faster you know, try to, 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 to elevate. If the stress comes from the soil, the, the soil gets the priority, the plant, the part of the plants in the soil. So if there is a water stress, plants doesn't grow higher, actually says, okay, no problem, I'm gonna invert. It shuts down the photosynthesis, some of the assimilates go down to the roots because remember it's not photosynthesizing, but the roots are growing because they are desperately in search of water. And so you get more roots uh, that way. So this mechanism changes by species, but to, to again, to your uh, question, yes, different species, different capacity, and I made uh, a, a, a separation in the beginning, depends how they're managed. So if, if corn is managed with no fertilizer and it, it lets grow for so many years, it will be far from getting 600 bushel. You barely get 100, you know, 100 bushel at the end because you run out of, uh, uh, the corn is a very highly consumptive crops because of the sizes 
and it doesn't fix nitrogen on its own, like you know, miscanthus or actually switchgrass does pretty well without fertilizer. So there is that mechanism that complicates even things. On fertilizer emissions being a big source of greenhouse gases, are all fertilizers critical? So if we had chemical fertilizers and organic fertilizers, manures, or uh, you know, byproducts from the animal processing industry, do those contribute to greenhouse gases equally? No, they don't. Um, so synthetic fertilizer are immediate emission. You put them and you have these big flushes of, um, again, at the, at the Kellogg Biological Station, we have a, a series of you know long-term data, the, the long-term ecological research side led by uh, Phil Robertson for so many years, now Nick Haddad. They've been measuring um, end to just basically continuously, right, on, on uh, automatic chambers. And so it's very diurnal, depends on the amount of water that, uh, you know, after the rain there is. So synthetic fertilizer immediately, and you may have you may be aware of this, is basically about roughly 1% of the fertilizer there is added. This is a very simple concept. It's called the mission factor that, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has done a very comprehensive review of looking at fertilizer rates, comparison, and emission. And so there was a consistent number. You put 100 pounds, you lose one pound. And that the problem is that one kilogram of N2O is 300 kilograms of CO2. It's 300 times more powerful in the global warming potential, like much rougher in the atmosphere. It traps a lot more, 300 times more powerful. And so manure, it's an organic form, okay? Does not have, plants do not use nitrogen in the organic form. They have to be mineralized. So mineralized first in form of, you know, nit uh, or two from o N2 to NO3. And um, then it can be used or nitrification to NH4, ammonium. So... This takes time. So the, the release is, uh, is the decomposition. It takes time. It doesn't immediately make nitrogen available from an organic compound available to the plants. So there is not an immediate you know, loss and that percentage is lower because it builds carbon, it retains carbon, uh, nitrogen is, is trapped more. The problem with the amendments of organic amendments is you also may have CH4, methane emission associated to that application, which is about 25 times more powerful than CO2. But overall, no, synthetic fertilizer are the ones that they use the most, obviously, and they are the greatest. But there is a new approach to slow release fertilizer. So basically they have shown to, um, they're still synthetic, the cost is still very high, but it does reduce N2O emissions because it slowly releases the amount of mineral nitrogen that could be vol uh, volatilized. And the other aspect of uh, N2O emissions and fertilizer is that has to be in a conditions that creates denitrification. So back to N2, you know, in the form. And that occurs when there is a flooding conditions, right? When there is um, lack of oxygen and normally when you add organic compounds, that doesn't happen. You are back on the healthy side of having greater porosity, better uh, conditions in general. So synthetic fertilizer are certainly the ones emitting uh, the most. But it's not even a natural, a cover crop will have emissions, not as high, obviously, as a fertilizer, but it's a natural process. Where Where would a crop be in terms of net nitrogen loss, if I planted corn year after year in the same place and I was, wasn't was doing tillage and I had, let's say I had really good soils, would I, would I need to add nitrogen or could I get that system to function without nitrogen addition? If I very, left all that biomass. Very good question. It goes back on the temporal time. It's on the first year. So, I, uh, you may have seen in some of my research um, by scaling and understanding this spatial variation has identified 
that each field, as like a farmer will, will know, but not all the farmers know that and can be scaled, that there are parts of the field that they're much better, you know, because they have deeper soil, like deeper volume. And, and so those, they, it becomes the back to the virtuous cycle where you have greater biomass, greater roots, greater decompositions, and you do accumulate that. The mineralization, so an organic, fully, let's say, or in this way, would be an organic source of management. If it's managed correctly, it could compensate, you, but you may not have the same level of yields. The yield could have a penalty on, on in the beginning. In the first years, it may not be sufficiently to, to compensate what you were used to. So we also seen and this long-term study that organic um, for our organic systems and in, in our case it was only cover crop and no tillage it did um, it just it could comp it could come close to the yields of the, the mineralization just because it isn't just about all nitrogen they held more water and the conventional tillage ran out of water much quicker okay so it's really a system so to answer your question Immediately, no, long-term, certainly can. And, but the yields are not, obviously, the 600 bushels, but they can easily get to the level of average uh, you know, yields, which will bring the benefits of trade-off analysis of the cost of doing things. Farmers need to uh, understand that, and they do, process, you know, for sure, not, not necessarily all of them, but Profit is also obtained by spending less, investing. So it's not, unfortunately, nitrogen is a cheap, uh, cheap and economic sorts of insurance as, as a scene. It costs significantly lower to put an extra pound compared to it's basically 50 cents versus $4 a bushel, you know, that you could get from, from the addition. And, and that's again back onto the trade offs. Are we serious about, you know, accumulating carbon and using it carbon to store and offset the emissions and so on versus the profit. I'm always of the idea that we need to be able to reward farmers for what they do in long-term sustainability, basically and keep carbon there and using more uh, sustainable management, which is to reduce amount of fertilizer. The reduce amount of fertilizer, it's very interesting, back to the space of variation, there are parts of the fields shouldn't even be cultivated with the same crop, but they are even cultivated with the same management. So a corn crop that yields 100 bushels on either on the edge of the field, on some you know poor conditions, that receives 200 you know pounds per acre of uh, on average on depending on you know let's say typical, and that's unacceptable because you're really uh, emitting much more. So converting those areas into more perennial in legumes, then you will build the soil and the system to be able to mineralize that. You know, given like some of the work you do with SIBO and in just some of the academic work you've done, it seems like a lot of the focus is on carbon emissions. But if you have nitrous oxide, which is worse at the end of the day, shouldn't there also be some concern about containing nitrogen within the system and is nitrogen the same as carbon if you reach that carbon saturation point in the soil where it's at equilibrium could nitrogen be the same in a in a cis natural system where everything that's being used is being stored in the soil either in the the biomass or in the living uh, microbial biomass in the soil yes very good the the first question, Diego, that's not necessarily, when we say carbon emissions, everything is converted into CO2 equivalent. So everybody knows that the greatest emissions come from N2O. And we reduce N2O, we aim to reduce N2O emissions, but they are addressed as a CO2 equivalent. So I am working on a way to basically create carbon credits by reducing, by better managing fertilizer it comes as a, a you know a benefits to the atmosphere because you reduce the, the CO2 equivalent from, from nitrogen. Nitrogen is critical also because people have talked enough and, and uh, but 
it's it's kind of lost now in terms of ben benefits from water quality is a critical aspect of nitrogen where you know it's and the system by definition in soils is a leaky system so nitrates because of the the way the molecule has this negative charge they're basically um, very mobile so the point of saturation is really hard to get because you get a flush and it, there it goes down you know uh, to the next layer and so on so the nitrogen in general it's never on a fully positive accumulation because it's used by the plant is the the um uh denitrified is vol volatilized but most of it is is basically lost as nitrate leaching and in addition some will be surface runoff you know that soils is taken with that but a third or more so back to the spatial variation in the areas of low nitrogen use efficiency these areas will take only 40 to 50 percent at the most of what it was applied so i bring this example often when i talk to uh, growers it says imagine you buy this pound a hundred pound bag and, and you dump the first 50 in the parking lot and then you go back to your field and you apply why did you apply you know so much more on these areas well they don't it's 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 just an example they don't necessarily know but now technology would eventually possibly in the end of the talk we could go on the future of how you know data and digital technologies could help but we have a very good knowledge of where these low areas in a field are and so you could now have 100 percent efficiency by putting 50 percent of the amount because the yield is basically that plant is small and only requires half of what it was demanding initially. So again, the point is saturation. It's it's uh, it's like uh, impossible because of uh, an open container. It, it, there, it doesn't have a bucket at the end. Carbon doesn't move. It's tight and it reaches. It's, it's like you can only put so much around it. Then with nitrates, because of the nature in the leaky system, they are lost as uh, nitrate leaching, and so they. Uh, that that's very difficult to manage just because of that in addition you may notice that there's still a tendency for various reasons i'm not here to judge but the majority of the application of fertilizer it's done at the end of the season without even knowing what you're going to basically get in the year and so obviously for reason of logistics reason of uh, possible lower prices and in the middle of the summer you may very well be short but they don't necessarily go back and so what do they do they kind of compensate with a larger amount you know in the beginning that's changing and they're doing all the way to now variable rate of application where one area gets one amount and another gets a different amount so there's quite a bit of improvements both in science of understanding the dynamics detecting these deficiencies but there is a combination of a culture of managing maybe more traditionally, but th that's very split. There are lots of progressive farmers. And so as a suggestion in general, imagine nitrogen to be like your food. You don't just stack up and cook a huge amount. You will be eating it through time. You won't be eating it all at once. So what's the point of cooking you know, 10 steaks when you can only eat one, then the rest is thrown away because you will be spoiled, right? That's the equivalent of the leach. And so if you apply the nitrogen when it's needed, which is difficult because synchronizing supply and demand is, is a complex. Sometimes you cannot go back in the field, but there are times when you can, and there is a limit where you can. There are alternatives with high boys and I'm more describing obviously a Midwest base in vegetables. It's very important to, you know, um, feed um, with more of a spoon type of approach than having all the ones because a fraction of that will be lost through water. Yeah. So even in the healthiest or best managed system, you're going to be are, needing to add some because it just are, is a leaky system. There are there are pores. There are micro pores yeah. as water comes down. It takes you don't lose it. Just to give you an idea. It's how long will it take for me to lose you know what i put in it's usually nitrates are never lost in the season they're always lost 
when the plants are not there to be taken out. So what's good about, you know, growing vegetable, you do have nitrogen that if you have another crop coming in, there is leftovers that can be used. The difficulties, remember, because of the nature of leaching, some of these nitrates are not in the surface. They're now a little bit deeper, quite a bit deeper. Now, now they are on the second floor of soil. So you could prevent some of it when, you know, deeper roots. But um, so again, the leaching could be up to 50%, but in a high yielding crop can be as low as 15%. What about in crop rotation? So, you know, we've talked to cover crops, legumes. Uh, a legume, when it's out of the field, that nitrogen that it's accumulated in its body, it's in its roots, that's not going to be instantly available. Do, do you get a slower, uh, I'll say, leaching into the soil as those that biomass breaks down? Or do you do you experience that flush like you do with a chemical fertilizer where eventually it's all going to come loose no it's the the first uh, aspect you introduced the cover crops and legumes that they are either left on the surface or put in the the beginning i mean the the, the top uh, top layers few inches takes time to decompose they need to have the decomposition time there is never a flush under the uh, uh, basically an, a green manure sorts of things versus the fertilizer. Why do we have fertilizer in the first place? Because they provide food when you need it. The nitrates are already in the form. Those legumes don't have, they're still organic. They don't have nitrates immediately. They still have to get out of the organic compounds that they are tied in to be able to be. So they have to go through that process, which is a tricky business because it takes time and you release, you have to have a plan using it. I've done a study just to, to, to compare that sometimes excessive amount of manures don't get you off the hook. They will still lose nitrates because in the off season, when plants continue to mineralize, then there are no crops to be taken up and it will still lose. So it's, it's, um, it's again, it's this uh, land and they allow, and, you know, basically lag of time of decomposition that allows the reduction in flushes of nitrates going down. Fertilizer, in comparison, you can have 60 to 100 parts per million, very huge, 10% is allowed. Okay, immediately. When, when do we see that now? When we collect water in, not in lysimeters? April, May, in, in the environment that I'm used to in the Midwest. The soil has been fully saturated with water of winter. You grow up in uh, East Coast, so there is, you know, a man of uh, plenty of snow, the soil thaws. Guess what? First sampling we get in the beginning of, you know, when the soil is thawed, very much, uh, you know, large component, large nitrates. And then the ones that is used, if it's used efficiently do, during the season, then the plants, basically it's like eating when they need it. And, and significantly lower is, um, is, is basically lost uh, to that. But a green manure is much more sustainable way of applying nitrogen in a form, but there is a price of the land of not being available. Anymore. So this is really the reasoning behind one of those NRCS principles of always keep a living root in the soil as long as possible is Obviously, it's feeding the soil through root exudates, but it's also soaking up any nitrogen that might otherwise be lost. Like you'd never want that soil sitting there. So in a leaky system with a leaky molecule, you always want something there trying to catch it so it doesn't have the chance to squeeze away. Spot on. Soil is one's company. Soil is designed to have plants. Plants use what is produced by the soil. And, and that's exactly the way it should be managed. I'm pushing Diego for some concept that farmers should be rewarded for the numbers of green surface they have over their soils. You know, some obviously uh, you would say, well, the Midwest, uh, you know, big chunk of time is white. Well, there's a cover crop underneath, you know, that could, that's considered basically a living organisms. And so rotation, we initially meant that, you know, touched upon the possibility of having such a, a beautiful 
uh, diversity of uh, individuals or microbes. And that's, that's extremely, extremely, um, you know, in, important to, to be able to have that. Yeah, can you elaborate on that on a, uh, a temperate climate standpoint? I mean, obviously, we don't have that problem here in California, but in in areas where you get winter, where you get snow, I think a lot of people take it for granted. Well, the ground's frozen, the snow's covering it. I don't need a living cover. What what cover crops would be beneficial to have in the ground under that snow cap? And why is that beneficial? And how does that play out over the season from the fall through the freeze to the thaw? Very good. Um, I was hoping we will get there because if you notice so far, we have not mentioned one word of uh, possibility of continue to degrade um, the land, which is erosion, soil erosion. So if you retain the residues and you have those roots as the cement that they keep the particle, doesn't matter you got snow, the snow blows, but not everything else, right? So first benefit of keeping the soil green in terms of having the cover is to protect from rain erosion and wind erosion, okay? Second, remember that wheat, winter wheat, resists to a temperature of minus 17 Celsius. That's roughly minus 30 Fahrenheit or so, okay? It has that. So the snow keeps it at a microclimate close to zero, that the plant kind of goes dormant for a little bit. But when the snow, in some places, especially now, in these more recent years, the, the soils are not fully covered by the snow all the time. There is a melting, and so there is basically life coming back in, the, in you know, on a very very slow uh, situation. But the first immediate benefit is keeping the soil cover and protecting from erosion. The next thing is, as soon as life comes back in the early spring, then the plant is already there. The roots are there; they're ready to go. Why? It gets warmer, and they have water. So the next thing, if, you, if you're interested in seeing the plant growing, it'll, it'll grow fast, right? Because of the initial warming temperature and the possibility of using that, that water, uh, you know, right there to be able to uh, allow uh, that, that to, uh, to... Now, what's interesting is because of this situation of, if you're not able to put a cover crop at the right time, why would you not be able to do that? Soil is too wet. You know, it's just in, you, you really could be in the fall. You have a significant amount. So one um, more recent, uh, is called interseeding. Okay. So interseeding at V3, V6, when the corn plant has three colored leaves. So it's about this top. You can basically plant the cover crop. We show there is two studies that I actually recently published uh, here with a project with a colleague of mine, uh, Karen Renner, in, in cover crops, be able to not compete. It basically doesn't affect, because corn has already gone in its own way. Why would not? Because it starts covering them. So light, but they're alive. They get some light coming through. And so when you harvest crop, you have a beautiful green crop that stays over winter and stays basically. You reduce the patchiness when you go in winter because of the variability, variability in soil water and uh, soil profile and temperature and texture. It'd be, what I mean by patchiness, one area would be very well established, another area wouldn't even, you know, consider, wouldn't come out. But if it's planted at, at a proper time through interceding when there is, then you will have a better stand a better observe, you know, possibility of getting that. And so that's an improvement of having interceding, which benefits back to the possibility of having this diversity of roots. And, and you have to be in a very dry condition, obviously. If you talk about having cover crops or interceding more in a Mediterranean climate, then it's not a popular thing to do because they will use water. Okay, so it depends. California is very similar in a way, but if it is done with the concept of uh, possibility of uh, building carbon, retaining water, even the rainfall that occurs, it, in, it allows better infiltration and, and less runoff because the intensity of the rain, it's reduced. Imagine a, a heavy rain hitting a soil with nothing on it 
and heavy rain hitting the leaf. And then slowly the, the droplets come in and you have a significant reduced runoff if you have a cover uh, on your soil. And so that's another benefit. This needs, I'm usually with my student, you know, we write diagrams and we see my, um, you know, message here is there is one size fits all, all but I heard that this does this. It's, it's just never be, um, uh, you have to be surprised all the time because how things, yes, there's one way, but there is this other component that pulls you back, <laughs> you know. So it's a system. It really is. It's a system of feedback and dynamics that uh, everything that I pretty much talked about with you, and, and I really compliment you with such a deep knowledge of putting the system together yourself to understand what, uh, how basically the soil plant atmosphere behaves across different spaces and, uh, and conditions. Yeah, and you know, I appreciate that. And I think that's a really good context for, for people to think about in this case. You know, one big thing you see a lot now in the veg world is interplanting multiple crops planted in the same space. You know, one negative to that, I mean, well, you mentioned if water's scarce, that's obviously one. If it affects harvesting, you know, that can be a problem. But let's say those aren't problems. Do do you think you get yield sacrifices or do you get a equal or potentially better yield out of both crops given that they're more crops and less space, they're they're sharing water, they're sharing nutrients? So again, you, you said the right thing. It depends on the context. If we go in southern Spain or southern Italy and again southern California, where you wish uh, you know to have additional water naturally. Then, then every drop is critical and, and should be prioritized to what you're basically trying to. But if you have a possibility to irrigate and you build, now I, I say the same thing as before, you're building a system that would build carbon and will retain um, pos, uh, you know, po the possibility of building the pos uh, uh, holding more water. And so in that case, you would be, it would be beneficial for everything that, that we just said. In the case of, um, you know, lack, lack of rainfall, then the soil needs to be covered with some other ways. So whether it's mulch or residues, because you want to prevent soil evaporation. Okay, so when you see the word of ET, evapotranspiration, it's like the blanket. If whatever you don't lose from soil evaporation, with our goal, is to basically have water go through the plant as maximizing transpiration, maximizing the water use through, because with the water you take, basically you keep the turgor in the cell, you take the nutrients and you're taking um, water away from soil evaporation. And so that's a balance that in, in the model that um, I developed, that that's balanced between the um, soil surface wetness, you know, wetness meaning if it is wet on the surface, transpiration is, is reduced. There is a microclimate, you know, compared then if the soil is dry, because if the soil is dry, it creates a um, sensible heat, like, you know, feeling really hot and, and additional feedback to water stress to the plant. So that, that benefit of having another plant I can't argue against not having water and having another plant. This is like not necessarily the way you want to do it. If you got, if you depend on rainfall, that doesn't come. Uh, but again, keeping the soil covered, it will benefit. In areas where you manage it, you do want to have because of the benefits of the microbial and the biology. Not to underestimate and and on the long term effects of remember retaining those residues. Remember that you are in debt from your saturation and as much you can bring that the more you bring that think of that and when you increase carbon you have another equivalent bucket you increase water so see it that way the more the more carbon the more stability you would increase to yield facing difficult conditions in terms of you know dipping into that carbon jar and using up some of that carbon no-till is is talked about as a way to, to stop that and slow that down. But no-till is kind of this umbrella. It's a sliding scale in terms of what that is. And some people, you know, they get really nuanced in terms of, you know, literally nothing 
to some people, you know, vertical tillage might count as no-till. Where, where does tillage become a problem? Is it depth? Is it a certain amount? Where if we we are in a human system, right? Like we need a certain amount of production. We have to be able to manage these things. Certain things can't happen using kind of idealistic systems. Is there an amount of uh, tillage that's kind of within that no-till regime that is probably okay? But if you start really going beyond that, that's when major damage starts to happen. Yes, very good point. One just one thing that I like the the audience to. Uh, the listener to understand you use the word we use carbon it's more we lose carbon you know because plants don't use it carbon from the soil we lose it in terms of basically co2 as a mechanism of respiration we accumulate carbon in the soil by bringing it in and we lose it from co2 emitted so roots don't use carbon they, they put carbon into the soil as and the microbes eat on on that and at some point, if we still have time, and it's important to explain the level of the different components of carbon, you know, how, why is it different? You know, the sugar, the lignin, and the cellulose and so on, cellulose. So, yes, um, the tillage is it, tricky. There is a mechanisms that should be avoided, which what we call inversion tillage, flipping the whole layer, moldboard plow, the old plowing what does plowing do negative effects basically creates a a, 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 um, a tillage pan basically a constipation like a restricting layer by by pushing and and you will have this to have a much lower conductivity of water so the layer is much more compacted okay so this clay pan or tillage pan and then you flip it what are you, you bringing the most active, everything living large and accumulating, you bring it upside down, you put it to the oxygen. So it gets basically immediately lost everything that you had. So tillage unfortunately has this difficult thing, which again, we cannot judge. It depends on the goal. It's an almost, you know, objective function is, but I need, uh, okay, how are you going to grow potato if you don't till? Right, and we like potatoes. Yeah, of course we like potatoes. So, can we mitigate that component of doing that? Why do we grow? Where do we grow potatoes? We tend to grow potatoes in sandy soils where there is much less to structure to start with. So, one thing about me is, is that I'm not uh, I'm um, above the parts in describing this system. So, no one can be offended if I say, "No tillage. You do one tillage, you lose pretty much a lot of what you have already accumulated because you just play." When you do the surface, and like you said, you know, you scrape the surface, you do a little bit of that. If it is non-inversion tillage, it is sometimes necessary, for example, in all the organic uh, system where you basically pull the weeds. Is that, there are so many studies comparing, is that scraping the surface to remove that weed and the weed being on the soil that brings carbon better than spraying it with an herbicide that costs you an arm and a leg in carbon and energy to, to spray it where you do no tillage. And so a full no tillage is the, the ideal situation where basically rotations, you can still do no tillage in, in controlling the weeds by having cover crops, you know, and, but there are, there are difficult, you still have to dry them down, you know, you have to kill them. And so you use chemical herbicide and you're ready to a level of complexity that you don't belong already into a certified, you know, kind of organic system. So back to your question, if you scrape that, what are you, you, what are you basically doing? You are losing that carbon you accumulated, but only from that layer. You haven't touched this part the part below that remains the aggregate remain the same right. so when you touch it you touch it it's open you break the aggregates and carbon is emitted as a co2 because the microbes can access the the, the carbon available and it's a feast if it is protected inside they stay in there it's not that they don't live they eat and poop you know and expel carbon in the aggregate and the aggregates are much closer, so that glue keeps growing and, and becomes. If you scrape that, five centimeters, you want to get rid of the weeds, then the damage is for those. You lose 
you change bulk density, you change that percent of carbon, and we can quantify exactly how much carbon you have emitted in the atmosphere mm. versus flipping the whole mobile plow. You know, you mix the hell out of that, and then you lose a large amount. But again, are you, can, can, you know, potatoes have to be done this way, but there are lots of other novel techniques of be able to uh, managing potatoes in a way that uh, could uh, accumulate more carbon. Yeah, it's a longer rotation where your potatoes and then your cover crops for a few years build that carbon back up. and then Exactly, and you maintain. That's exactly right. No potatoes after potatoes. So you go back to your, you can have your hairy vetch and clover as cover crop right away. You have corn and, and soybeans and, and you bring that to the system what, what you need. Then because, because we have to eat potatoes, there's no question on their bounties and the value and fibers and all the positive aspect of that. So, yeah. well, let's, let's look at what you were talking about previously, you know, different forms of carbon. So people, you know, listening to this, they think of okay, carbon in the soil. You have a few things. You have a living root. You have the exudates coming out of that root. You mm -hmm. have the microbes in the soil that have carbon in their bodies. And then you have previous plant material that's left in the soil. So all these different forms of carbon, when you talk about that, how do you explain this to people and, and how do you value these in the system? Yes. So I try to keep simple because it's, it's a complex uh, matter. And you have to start separating what we call as organic matter. One is fresh organic matter and one is soil organic matter. Well, you say the fresh is in the soil. Yes, but it's a fresh organic matter are the roots, all the residues. So more plant-based related. Manure, fresh organic, you know, you put it from fresh that is quickly decomposed. Now that fresh organic matter has different pools. And these pools are just like, what would you think? Uh, I mean, I don't know about, uh, if I can think of a good example, but if you were to eat something and you know it wouldn't be bad for you, most of us probably would choose dessert to eat first. Right, because so there is the first thing that the microbe eat are sugar, so they eat the sugars, the carbohydrates, and that's very labile, really quick to decompose. They eat it, full expel. Then they go on the chewy stuff, the fiber, like we, you know, like more of it, and that's the uh, cellulose and hemicellulose, the component of you know people are more familiar with those concept in the trees and the bark and so semi -L. Then lignin, much harder and chewy and that's still the roots and so a leaf how long does it take for a leaf in the fall to decompose i mean you look at it it's gone just about you know a few months because it's well, how much lignin does it have very little compared it's much more soft and and versus you know a piece of wood that has a significant amount of uh you know lignin and the fresh organic matter so it's the first thing and the things that those microbes they become the organic carbon, and the organic carbon has three different pools. We call it pools, again, as a qualitative description. A labile pool, very quick turnaround, less than six months to a year. It depends really on the type of where the soils and climate and everything, but very short dynamics. Then you have the intermediate or slow pool. That's what we wish to have the most the humic form, things that stays and becomes that colloidal material, black looking stuff, the good soil organic carbon, biochar, for example, stays. It's a lot of all the other stuff is gone. You maintain it in the soil, very good amendment, but biochar is almost also towards, you know, more resistant. Then you got a resistant or passive, as you want to call, those are the ones that we use for carbon dating. You know, you can go back to the Romans time and you know where that stone, how, how old is, because there's carbon that will last for so long. But normally those are in the, the century old uh, type of dynamics to decompose that. And each of them, every time it decomposes, releases CO2, it goes into the atmosphere. So the first um, component, 60% of the first pool immediately when decomposed, CO2. Organic matter from, from this labile, some of it is accumulated and goes into the slow pool. That one gets decomposed much slower over a longer period of time, goes to CO2, 
and each of them. So it's basically this, if you imagine almost this six kind of circle, three above fresh organic matter, you know, lard bile, um, the, the, the carbohydrates, uh, hemicellulose, cellulose, lignin, lard bile pool, intermediate pool, humus, slow and resistant. Yeah, for somebody, you know, if we want that intermediate pool, how do you get that into the soil? How do you build that up? If you wanted to turn that number up in your soil, what are ways somebody would do that? You add carbon, you add residues, you add roots. You, it, cannot, it cannot be produced by itself. It has to come from outside. It has to come from living organism. It comes from fresh. Oh, those three pools above are connected to the one below. Those are the ones that funnel into that. So how do you accumulate that? By putting mulch, by putting manure, by putting... So organic matter, per se, like I said, is 60% carbon. So it's... But don't, that gets burned quickly because it's the fresh organic matter. So a big chunk of that is lost. But one thing is when you do a soil sampling and you get a big, large number in a mineral soils, you have got a piece of fresh organic matter somehow. Or something is not, you know, it cannot be a 12, 13% organic matter uh, converted into 6 or 7% organic carbon in a very short time, knowing what your equilibrium is and where you are in the rotation, if you are in a grazing system or, um, so there is a, that, that, it doesn't mean that, oh, I didn't see anything or there was a business thing. It's very, you know, a fine decomposition, but that's, that will eventually be lost. That's what I'm saying. It, it looks there, but it's going to be lost. The one that stays is the organic carbon. And if you look at the literature and the sampling over time for all this, when you analyze for organic carbon, it changes very little. It could change a lot if you add, um, basically add more, more, carbon in the form of uh, fresh organic matter roots and uh, so, the, so that fresh organic matter under the soil uh, microbes start to eat it and that's how it ends up in that intermediate pool eventually it's in those bodies of those organisms some, those some, or- some is emitted you can prevent that some is lost as part of the decomposition so roughly three tons of in a, in a maize system you know you return five it is no till you could return five tons 3.5 tons of loss per CO2, unpreventable, but you have accumulated one ton. And then the next you don't touch, you keep doing good yield, you keep bringing that, that's another ton. That's so. But when you had the ton out of a volume, if you want to one, calculate the stock, Diego, is you have an organic percent, which is whatever number, you have the depth that you're using, and you have bulk density. What's about the, the density of the soil? you know, the weight of the, the, the soils over the volume. And so when you multiply the percent carbon with the bus density, you have the, uh, the, the volume of the soil percent of that. So an example, I, I mean, just by doing it in, in my mind, there are roughly, you know, 25,000 kilograms in 1.3% bulk density for 15 centimeters. And that, that's basically the stock. So you added one ton, it's 24, it's 0.1%. It's very little increase, but it's it's going up, right? And But as soon as you open that jar, it's no longer three of the decomposition. It becomes four or five because you're adding these layers that you slowly open by mixing that uh, that soil, uh, you know, with the tillage. We covered a lot of ground. I hope it was clear, but... Um, no, no, it's, it's, it's good. And that's how even got me thinking. I mean, um, is above ground in... Below ground decomposition of carbon equal. So above ground, like the dry biomass, most of that just goes away into the sky uh, when it breaks down. When you go underground, if you look at the dry biomass of the roots, does that break down and volatilize as much as above ground? Because what I'm getting at, would you rather be putting 100 units on soil surface or 100 units below soil surface if you want to keep as much carbon in the soil? Very, very good question. If you put it on the surface, it won't decompose as fast. So that carbon stays there. It can be been blown out, you know, with wind and everything. But if it's if it stays, Argentina is a perfect example. You go to a field in Argentina and you are walking on a mattress of residues. You don't see the soil. I mean, there is this much 
amount of beautiful, small, finely broken soybean and corn stalks residues. That's the true carbon that we are not putting in the atmosphere. That stays there for, for a long time. What happens eventually, if you, you don't want it to be, if it's lost, it just goes to another place. So to answer your question, you very, very correctly pointed out, what happens if you put it in the soil? You bring the organic matter in the soil higher, you add in carbon, but there is a fraction of that that's lost to CO2. So it's a balance. If you keep it on the surface, it doesn't get decomposed. That's, that's pure carbon. 40 to 50% roughly of that amount of biomass is carbon stored there. You put it in there, 60% of that goes to CO2. So 40% stays. In the soil. In the soil, yeah. So, but up there, it's nearly 100%. Because there are no microbes slowly, yeah, microbe will. So the, the there is normally this is actually even we do it in in the in the in the model that that top mulch works its way through, and that's why the top soil always has higher organic matter, and this residue never really reach you know much deeper, uh, except for the rooting system. That over time, if they are um, well grown and, and established, you can have root system in in corn going down, uh, you know, three feet, four feet uh, down. Alpha alpha is nearly, you know, five meters, and so um, that that I don't know if that explains. So if you no, leave it, it there, does. And, it, and thinking of that thick mat, like one thing I always think is, is like when you put roots in the soil, you're building soil down, like because the roots are pushing down where you can't go. If you're if you're putting organic matter on top as a mulch. You're building soil up because eventually that mulch layer, like the soil level rises up, correct? Yeah. You building soils, you build, yeah, you making a step that is free over time that you slowly, it takes very little to, to lose soil and it takes hundreds of years to build soils. How do you build soils? With exactly the way you said, you're basically building this that eventually, this, you seeing things decompose. You put a seed, that will grow, right? That's new sorts of, because then it gets mixed in and it slowly improves. If you put it there, it's not that you never want to put it in there because roots are there and you want to keep them there and so on, but some gets decomposed. Now it's, it's, a, met, it's a rate, it's a balance, how fast you put it out versus how fast you, you draw your, you know, your bank account. So the roots get decomposed, but you next year you put more residues and the roots and the yield is getting bigger. Those three tons, but you put four, you accumulated one. So the prevention, the CO2 is unprevented. It's, it's part of the decomposition. Now, but there are thresholds. There's complexity. It's not always, if it is cold, what happens? Nothing happens. It means the soil carbon stays like that. It stays like the surface. If it is too wet, also it can kind of becomes, you know, it gets D95, but there is conditions not good. Best example I can do, tropical soils, desert. How much carbon is in those soils? Man, they got rain. They got plenty of vegetation, right? In tropic, tropic conditions. Why there's no carbon? There's, there's no carbon. 0.5, 1%, less. Everything expedite because of the temperature. So the, the temperature plays a big role and soil water content plays a big role. And there is an optimum of mineralization, of decompositions of this. So cold conditions, the prairie, the Midwest, and uh, Illinois soils of, you know, four, five percent, three, three, four percent, because they, they were at 5.5 and they lost it once they till. They try, so cold is good, keeps, preserves you, everything is good. Hot turns things down. And so that's also with water content. And so we have functions. Another thing is percent of clay. Percent of clay, clay plays a, a protection factor. So basically the, the, by the, the, the biogeochemistry, carbon is tied to and it's much more um, difficult to decompose on a clay particle. Sandy soils, how much carbon is in sandy soil? 
significantly lower than clay because in clay is protected. We've done soil biology 101, maybe yeah, 201, no. you know. So well, it's good. And you know, one thing you mentioned a little while back is one of those intermediate forms of carbon, biochar. I've talked to people on the podcast about it. You know, what are your thoughts of it? You know, the the, the theory, you have a yeah. chunk no, of pure I, carbon. I, I, you put it in the soil, it stays there, and it stays there for a very long period of time. While it may right. not be greatly beneficial to the soil, at least it's not going up into the sky. How do you view it? I view it positively in terms of it is carbon. It stays there for 100 years. Terra Negra in Brazil, you know, this basically beautiful black is that you may have already heard about, you know, the results of the pyrolysis and slow temperature. So it's, it's a good carbon. The cost benefit is not my analysis to do, but it's equivalent. You say, okay, I'm getting a lot of free carbon that stays in the soil and it's going to build. Does it pay immediately? Not immediately. That's, that's a build up that you do over time, you know, that you basically prime the system to have this carbon. And so, it's more of an economic evaluation because there are other forms of possible amendments that you can add. Now, and again, the goal is not to go in the economic analysis, but it is, it is carbon, it is positive and stays there for a long time. It does improve. The literature is divided. I mean, in terms of saying, because it's, they, I think, don't want to judge, but they were seeing, oh, one study show yield effect increase, another study decline. It, it's you can't translate it like that. It depends where they were done, how the weather occur. It wasn't even if you isolate everything. Sometimes studies forget about the dynamics of you know consecutive days that it was hotter versus another. So it's much more complex. And most of these studies were maybe not taken as a system approach of integrating all. So that's really difficult to detangle uh, the immediate impact on that. But I see it as a more um, again, just to bring in, what are we adding? We're adding carbon. Good. Yeah. And how do you see that playing into the future of carbon credit markets where, you know, you can take scrap wood, brush, tree trimmings. Uh, you could, you could grow trees in a way where you pollard them or coppice them off and burn that off. And then you take what could otherwise sit on the surface and, and erode or decompose and you can stabilize that and put it underground like is that a potential avenue for offsetting carbon emissions in the future you know with you looking at a lot of you know carbon modeling yes so that's a very good question the um, carbon sequestration we covered enough that is critical and i think farmers need to be rewarded for doing the right thing of keeping carbon in the soil now is it it's very difficult to measure carbon in terms of not the measurement even i mean partially the measurement per se because some laboratory we have actually having fun doing comparison of laboratory tests and getting different results from the same soil samples which so the level of uncertainty is in a value when you get is is pretty large um just from the laboratory where you sample in one place in the field versus another so my take on this thing is that, okay, you take a piece of wood and you put it in the soil and you think you have added carbon for what we have talked about it. That thing, yes, it is carbon, but it's, it takes forever to decompose because it's really, you know, uh, just not chewable and, and it's not immediate to see this, what we call more uh, of uh, real organic carbon. So the modeling components goes hand to hand to some of the measurements in two ways. First of all, there is a role in remote sensing to be able to identify areas of variations where you could target some of uh, you know your samples. But I actually believe that the approach, for example, that SIBO has taken in creating what we call regenerative potentials. So we know well how a crop grows pretty well. I mean, to the level of maybe less than five to ten percent. And if you're interested, I'll tell you some of the story about the modeling, but five to 10% accuracy in getting that crop. And once you have, that's not even a, a level of error. That crop is returned and it's returned every single year. 
it's it's much more it's sufficiently safe to use a model with the conditions of what was done in terms of a farmer reporting i have been doing these practices i have not been till i start from these conditions of this soil type which it's pretty well known and i've grown hairy vets or rye well we will know under those conditions because that's known both statistically observation and modeling you say okay in this environment is roughly three tons then some is lost so there is a pretty well mass balance of what is returned and so my ho hope is really to be able to get the market of carbon not just the carbon but include nitrogen the abatement from nitrogen is critical because if you're doing so much more on your land by reducing the emissions in managing nitrogen better, that needs to be part of that regenerative potential altogether. But it has to be paid year on, every single year. There are other approaches where, okay, it says, okay, you subscribe, we'll see you in five years, on 10 years. That's nearly impossible for a farmer to stick to some of you know the promises or not be able to 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 take the risk of doing things they're beneficial and they need to be so that's why i'm working with some of the agency to be able to reward them independently just by doing the right thing and that's something that hopefully will soon be more um you know considered including again one example that i made earlier removing this unproductive land and be able to uh, have more you know, perennials and uh, continues back to the prairies, continue to have this mass balance of, you know, carbon accumulating from the atmosphere into the soil to the roots and be rewarded because they've taken some of their land off from, from production. So the, the year on versus 10 years where with the dynamics, the change will, could be small. The credits that you accumulate over 10 years of time, it needs to be more on year on because you keep the farmer interested and becomes almost a new way of farming, a carbon farming. You you basically are realizing because now is is not very high cost. Now I think in cap and trade California is about fifteen point seventy five and then sixteen dollars a ton. Companies have made you know have spoken and, and you know the companies saying, oh we're willing to pay sixty dollars a ton, a hundred dollars a ton, hundred dollars a ton when you can accumulate one ton already and you have a hundred dollars per acre right there, they don't make it that now. They are on a very thin margin, especially the, you know, more row crop, you know, corn, soy beans, and they're protected by the insurance. Sometimes insurance is given for wrong reasons in terms of some of these areas. Again, it could be a mechanisms of converting the same amount of money to do the right thing of uh, bringing carbon. So, what I'm saying is carbon farming is the new way and digital agriculture could help that in terms of accumulating data, using models. That's why obviously I'm biased because I co-founded, you know, Civil Technologies, but the approach of being scalable and identifying the regenerative potential of the soil, this soil versus another soil, it's on a year on is, is a much more, um, you know, uh, beneficial to, to envision this more carbon farming than the very slow kind of sampling after 10 years uh, because farmers will just not play that game. And if you look ahead 10 years, do you think you see um, a landscape, no pun intended, where farmers have a cash crop, maybe that's corn and soy, maybe that's cattle, maybe that's vegetables, and they also have a carbon crop where they're selling off those credits on a year to year I basis? You took words out of my mouth. I would ex exactly say a much more diverse type of cultivation and management of uh, you know their land, including, like I said, more biodiversity, pollinators, bringing you know the butterfly bank and all the benefits in one section that is poor, the veggie in another area, and possibly cut the middleman and do you know more the new Amazon of going around and collect, just things that uh, certainly this more diverse and the carbon farming will be one. In addition, I see a change in generation, Diego, with the farmers reaching an age, you know, 60, 65, on average, new kids coming, 
very much into technology. You know, they uh, use, um, they're attracted to the some of the, uh, the research that I do, flying drones and robotics could play. You know, could easily envision electric robots. You could easily envision uh, biodegestate, you know, basically create energy on your farm to uh, drive some of this. There is all that. That's through all this carbon su uh, support in some way. But we, we have uh, a long way. Hopefully, it's an exponential curve that goes, you know, faster. Um, and But I am certainly optimistic. But And I work towards that. I work um, on the side of farmer when they do the right thing, don't oppose when they don't do the right thing. Because it's uh, it's very important to connect agriculture as a, be a solution, be uh, satisfying the consumers. They are demanding, they want more transparency, but they also need to be able to pay more. And no one wants to do that. So there is always this complexity of trade off. No one wants to obviously hear about you know taxes on carbon because it's more of a natural, but then somehow, whether it's taxes or policy on incentives, they basically it will be the new way for sure where. Things, it will be another layer of potential incomes in addition to the quality of the products and new technology by verification, you know, blockchain or other system to, to quickly verify what goes on and a uh, very quick way of selling carbon on the internet where you can swipe your car. I always upset my emission if I flew to a place and, you know, $10, it was trees. Now it can be salt carbon. Uh, and, and that's very much doable because what do you do? You improve the quality of agriculture, you improve the food, not just, uh, you know, planting, uh, planting an agri tree with all the respect, which is a very, uh, the proper way to do it and, uh, also. Yeah. Hey, if you wanted to sequester the most carbon, if you could, like say that was just, that was your goal. You got a thousand acres. You want to sequester as much carbon as you can using agricultural practices on that thousand acres what would be your approach it's it's a very good question because you didn't give me a time frame right and that's the the the, the, the difficult thing is so first of all chemical uses just already makes you go on a negative side but that's the difficulty so i don't necessarily have an immediate answer but i would use the vegetations that is undisturbed to build if you wanted to do true carbon that would be something that would allow to sequester. We already talked about it. rotation, no tillage, cover crops, um, you know, keeping the soil green immediately. That's talking by keywords. Those are the four, you know, immediate things. You want to sequester carbon in terms of that, you can use a lot of the land for solar. That's still kind of carbon that if you see carbon as a offset to the emissions, that's an additional uh, things. The diversification, diversified crops, meaning, and I grew up in an area in Italy where there were four crops at the same time. Four, four crops growing. How would that be? Different height, different spatial. So that's a, a way of basically doing that. There were veggie, there were grapes, there were olives, there were pecans, you know, like walnuts or in a very rich soil of organic carbon continuously keeping residues going so would that be the fast way certainly it would be the way of bringing soil health you know back into the picture but in comparison it has to be done and the difficulty is you want to increase yield and you say i can't use fertilizer it'll take longer because you got to build remember one part of the conversation we had you have to allow these organic carbon to be decomposed to release nutrients and so fertilizer would give you the boost, but they already pulled you down. It's, it's running with, you know, driving with your brake kind of tools because you already pulled you down by the emissions of N2O. So in a perfect world, if you had two plants that were equal, is it fair to say the one that produces more root biomass is sequestering more carbon? Indeed. So do you see, do you see a day where maybe somebody like a Corteva goes out there and they are engineering and breeding out plants like so you have your corn plant that's already high yielding but now we're going to breed that thing to put on as much root mass as possible in one of the papers that actually i am writing with colleagues we have identified you know venues of improving uh, basically the future of 
becoming, let's put this, that we haven't introduced it, a more circular system. You know, circularity, there is a trend, uh, was a few years ago, it's coming back, you know, circular economy, recycle, reduce waste. And so the circularity in, in this way is basically through digital agriculture by doing the right thing at the right time, in the right place, electric robots and genetic improvement. Not only just deeper roots, yes, 100%. Nitrogen fixing roots, right? So that will be, it's not impossible because we can do just about anything. It's a matter of time and investment if you can do that. So imagine if fixing corn, I said, is still the king of the crop, right? Over 20 tons of biomass produced, 10 are taken out, 10 are returned. Compared to any other thing you return, maybe two or one, you know, three, that's three, four times, you're gaining basically 10 years out of every two, three years. So that, the additional piece is electrification for overbosh, you know, creating fertilizer, synthetic, synthetic, which is not necessarily a word of saying fertilizer, it's, it's a way of basically producing nitrogen the way naturally is produced in terms of through decomposition, but it's readily available. So if it is obtained on the farm, by having energy, and that's a long term. We're talking about future, Diego, right? It's, it can be 15, 20 years, maybe less, maybe more, depending on the investment on the vision of our leaders. And then if you produce fertilizer that is produced with electricity and not from fossil fuels, then we win. Then we can certainly abate one degrees and all the concentration of CO2. So we touched on what's available now, the digital agriculture, the modeling and the forecasting and the robotics available now. Rooting and genetics is coming up for sure. Fixing and electrification also is, is coming. So if there are labs doing that, if you put it all together, we that's the pathway that I'm trying to publish. One thing we talked about previously, um, and you got me thinking about it now today was climate change and how this affects things. So you have climate change happening, warming, and you have areas that are becoming, you know, maybe warmer sooner, warmer later, warmer during the course of the season. And at the same time, you go back to like the tropics where organic matter is being volatilized faster. So if you, if you heat everything up, you're burning more energy, but if you have warmer temperatures for longer, your yield potential goes up, so you can potentially sequester more carbon. How do those two fight against each other? It's very good. Uh, you must have a PhD. <laughs> and <laughs> good job. So temperature, it plays a critical role. Remember that as temperature goes up, everything is expedited. We sweat when it's hot. Plants do the same thing. So the cycle, to, to explain this trade off that you're saying, Climate change for, there are winners and losers, right? I've done some work in Siberia and it's a potential big benefit because you have a much longer season. Does it mean that in the middle of the summer, it doesn't get hot? No, it gets hotter. Does it, and then what does it mean? They will still expedite development during that time. So the, the, the answer to your question is adaptation, adaptation to new cultivars. So if you use the same cultivar that is getting warmer and you only planted it earlier because you know it's warmer, you're running short at the end. You're not taking advantage because the faster development that occurs, the degree days, the heat units that the plant has to accumulate, it will accumulate no matter what. That will accumulate it, you know, now in August instead of, you know, mid-September if you anticipate. But if you have a much longer duration cultivar, then now you are sequestering a much greater yield. In fact, if you simulate a long duration cultivar, you basically have a much uh, longer time to grow. And so if you quickly allow me to explain, you know, the plant does two processes. It grows and it develops. The development is the cycle. It's the duration of how long stays on the ground. That's set by genetics, okay? That's set by a number of degree days that is set. If it gets hot, those degree days are, are reached much quicker because the degree days are calculated as the air temperature minus the temperature that we call base temperature, the temperature below which the plant does not develop, stays in the same chronological stages, doesn't go to the next phase. 
Growth is the accumulation of biomass, is a physical weight accumulation, more, you know, heavier, basically kilograms accumulated. So back to the 10 pins and 100 pins, instead of the selection, if you and I, you know, go have a, you know, different, I have 10 minutes to eat as much as I want and you have an hour, you will always eat more because you have an hour. So that hour is the longer growing cycle that you have because of a cooler, you know, possibility of not reaching those degree days in a much longer period of time. And so the higher the temperature, the shorter the cycle, the shorter the plants are going to be on that, the lower probability of the lower accumulation of photosynthesis. They're just less on, on that piece of land. They suppress less carbon through photosynthesis. So to your question is adaptation is if you use now a genetics that allows you to anticipate your planning, you're going to, you cannot necessarily eliminate the heat in the middle of the summer but you have now a longer period and you could sequest more and return more carbon into uh, the soils. But so kind of in a correctly. perverse way, we can use global warming to our advantage to pull carbon out. Exactly. Yeah. Certainly it is. And the places in the north are benefiting. Do they say this is the nest, the, the corn belt already now? Because you see the shift, the amount of corn that is grown in North Dakota, Minnesota, going into Canada. Saskatchewan. I mean, the word Saskatchewan, I mean, what's first thing? Coal. But it's just, just getting there. And so that's a benefit. Was it, was it the same amount of carbon sequestered before you had corn there? Far from it. Because the amount of biomass that are corn sequestered, right, is much greater. So that's exactly the winners. And does it get harder in places like, unfortunately, it's always like this. You know, the, the, it's, um, the hotter place will get worse, and so the more vulnerable areas are the ones that are already kind of in a more dire uh, situation because right. more, more heat, more, uh, more storms, greater storms, greater um, humidity in the atmosphere. Just um, it's just, yeah creates the, obviously these extreme events and so on that uh, is negative in addition to the higher temperature, which uh, expedites decompositions and and uh, low organic matter at the moment in the soil. You know, one, one of the problems we've talked about today, and you brought this up again in a previous conversation, was so we know nitrogen's a problem today, overuse of nitrogen. And, and you talked about some things you looked at in Italy where it was nitrogen management of how much nitrogen you're putting on versus nitrogen that's coming out and yield in the form of protein content in the crop and there's not a lot of that here. I think that's a topic that a lot of people have heard nothing about. I don't know really anything about it other than what I've heard from you. Can you can you talk about that and maybe how that could could shift the way uh, we look at agriculture and with the way maybe producers yeah. farm? I mean, as you know, um, California is very much like Italy. You, we, we, we're really blessed with uh, the way the agriculture is in these areas in terms of the possibility of having so many sunny days and and so that's a possibility with good soils is a possibility of having products that they're much more uh, favorable in terms of quality and and um, just taste but besides the vegetables growing in these areas and the possibility of smaller scale agriculture and spoon feeding and and lower amount of fertilizer there's almost no fertilizer used in uh, in these small patches of the quick rotations that uh, uh, I was mentioning earlier, I'm, I'm just describing the more, you know, high quality, slow food type of approach, you know, that goes into, is sold to the schools and uh, really um, high level of, of food and so on. What is it, what I've worked on for several times was an interesting question from producers of pasta production. Pasta is a very good, is a vet, is a, a, a food for, for vegans and pasta, everyone is attracted. I know it is a carb and then people are more uh, fearful of uh, using it and accumulate weight in, instead of thinking of giving you the available energy to exercise and to do things and so on. So it's a very stable food, obviously, in Italy. And so it contains normally about 12, 13% proteins. Now, so both the pasta uh, companies like Barilla, De Chico, these really big, have 
pushed farmers to increase the protein content, which is a greater quality, a better product that here, unfortunately, is far. I've talked to several wheat um, boards and growers and and uh, the, the use is much more for uh, a different topics, you know, crackers, lower quality. And, and so the way you manage nitrogen there, it's first of all is lower in terms of amount because there's not enough water. There's a, uh, it has to be very well synchronized when it's applied. Wheat uses less nitrogen, obviously, then because it's smaller biomass than maize. But the timing of application plays a critical role in the way the, uh, the proteins are accumulated. And the interesting fact that this comp- the pasta production company made is, yes, we want higher protein content, but that has to be coupled with a good grain. You can have higher protein content, but it can be all grain. It's like really shrivered, more concentrated grain, smaller. And in Italy, they say that will give that to the chicken and not for pasta production. So that can be 17, 17, 18%. So the weight of the grains are weighted in a hundred, you know, in a a tolytric weight and there are different testing, uh, test weight and so on. So the coupling of the quality of the grain with the endosperm and the protein means that you have to manage the crop well throughout. And which means feeding the crop two, three times fertilizer to, to basically make use of it and matching with the demand. So long story short, if you put nitrogen towards the end of the uptake in wheat, it goes all into proteins. And so now you can have easily 14 to 15% protein and growers get a premium. And it's a substantial premium from an economic point of view. They are, it's an excessive incentive, it's an additional incentives that they value because they were growing wheat no matter what. They have incentives from the European Union. So they do relatively well in terms of matching both uh, a better management of a crop in addition to satisfying the demands until they get paid with a premium. But it comes from the private sector. Um, the, 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 the government in, in Italy and the European commissions provides incentives from um, an environmental standpoint, the amount of it needs to be used. So the uniqueness was through this work is giving the right amount at the right time at the right place with the goal, not just having higher yield, but also higher quality of the grains, higher proteins. You know, being in the Midwest, I mean, do you think we're too yield centric now where, where a lot of application is just focus on bushels per acre and it's not quality. And I, I don't think that's necessarily a big farm problem. I think that probably translates all the way down to the smallest farms. It's I need to produce volume and I'm not focusing enough. And it sounds like a, I mean, a complex problem. And a grower really has to know their, their operation, where our plan is in the cycle. And I don't know that there's an easy way to solve that, but you know, that seems like that's another future wave here of amending and growing for nutrient quant- quantity and quality versus just weight, volume. You you have identified that's the current uh, way of how you know the farmers get paid on, on productivity. But I think there are three ways they can do you know basically productivity. They can be monetized the environment, and they can do better quality of the product. If the consumers and so as, as you know, Diego, I mean agriculture is divided as agriculture and food system. Behind the agriculture. There is a significant amount of interest by multinational in managing the supplies, you know, but seeds, fertilizer, and, and so that drives, they want to make sure that the seeds that they're, they sell are optimized best conditions to get the greatest yield. Greatest yield means more money to the farmer. There's no dent in that cal- calculation. Right? There's trillion kind of huge amount of money behind that concept. And at the same time, consumers say, hey, I can't drink the water in Toledo. It's like, what are you guys doing? And you got to be doing things better. Now they already, farmers are pulled back and say, oh, okay, so we can't really do all these applications and we got to do that. But the, the producers, I mean, uh, the, the, the consumers need to realize that 
farm we in science we know a significant amount of money but sometimes they're not adopted because of profitability because of you know that will cost it'll cost to the farmer and so somewhere there needs to become you know basically either generates immediate money to the farmer some ways or and they need to be paid incentivized to basically be able to adopt that consumers at the same time so where does this money come does it always have to come from the government could come from a greater price so if you have three dollar eighty for a corn if it was seven dollars they could afford some of that in terms of managing better and reducing the yield because now they have a better price and that price could be compensated by the consumers wanting to do that um and then and the farmers are the last one to really make money because think how much it costs of you know steak that the grains is being fed versus you know the grain itself so the food system is very important in quality i wish we would have you know always the quality we would we have now uh, just been exposed that we want things all the time right and there was there's no more seasonality there is no more in italy there is again this concept of you know zero miles low by local i mean here too is is becoming more important but a big producer that has a massive amount also wants to be able to export. So it is a very complex system. And so both the, 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 the profitability, the environmental sustainability, and the environmental uh, justice for the community, they have to come together. And we're trying to do that with this more circularity, making the system more circular. There is science that has these visions about what we talked about, which was not not a uh, you know fiction science fiction movie that's basically happening it's it was just a a, um, a trailer and that will happen so i think uh, that's the complexity of uh, justifying now that they get paid on productivity but it could change if everybody's willing to put their own their interest away in coming together of participating to that table by chipping in now, in staying in Italy, you mentioned you grew up around a system. It was wheat, grapes, olives, pecans. I Tomatoes. think that okay, yeah. I think that is a that polyculture system is a lot of what newer people looking to get into ag romanticize about. How do you see? I mean, having seen systems like that, why why do you think they're have kind of been abandoned you don't see them as much outside of europe and is there a viable future in that type of system i have uh, an optimistic look on that because new generation is becoming more uh, attracted to the land to be able to do things i see a lot more young people wanting to do as you know agriculture is such a hard work and i think the the combination of being green, sustainable, quality food, being the food system in the open space, obviously has so much attraction. That's one of the reasons I wanted to be in agriculture is actually to help to produce food and um, you know for the poor and and so on. But um, I ended up here by a used system that they go uh, globally, but uh, and sustainability from an environmental standpoint. So I think Europe has maintained because the way the population is. I mean, Naples metropolitan area is, you know, 4 million and then there are patches of land everywhere and growing and you can buy the, just the best zucchini vegetables and so on when, when the season is right. And here you have that example in California, I'm sure. I mean, it's just much more present there. Some parts in the New York, outside the city, and, and, and just about any city. So we basically, Diego, we're going towards a little bit more urban agriculture in many ways. The term may not be right, but that's what it really is, right? You know, this polyculture. The sizes, the land sizes makes a difference because imagine a small grower can't afford to have, you know, very net investment in much large machineries, right? And because of the sizes and 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 so the science is compensated by having people to work and be able to be very dynamic and be building that soil health and so on. But when you deal with the Midwest, where your neighbor is 50 miles away, you know, and, you know, you got, and also the Midwest is still the Midwest because you can grow corn without irrigation. You know, 15% only of the Midwest is irrigated. 
there is a demand for grains for you know feed the cows there is a demand for more vegan more plant-based so there will be a natural transition i envision not to change necessarily not that i wish but not to see a major change in the way the land is distributed in terms of corn just because it's um for the reason that i've said but i would see a significant amount of uh, i've actually seen it in michigan much much more it's one after california is the most diverse uh, type of agriculture and so a lot of the farmers that we work with very progressive they also have few acres unfortunately you know of uh, vegetables the season is much shorter so they have to be dealing with that so i think it's a transition Diego, that is slowly happening you see much more fresh market uh, you know farmers going to the, the farmers market is beautiful farmers market in detroit uh, it's uh, uh yeah it's it's the way the cities are distributed and it's happening uh, slowly but surely also uh, here and just to close this out, there's a lot of vegetable farmers listening to this, smaller land holdings. What would you encourage vegetable farmers to do to, to build soil carbon, to sequester carbon, to grow better crops? Like, what can they do in their systems, given that they're uh, fast rotations of crops? What can a vegetable farmer do? I don't know if I necessarily have any suggestion for them because I believe they already do a pretty good job. I mean, to grow a vegetable, you have to have a good soil. The, uh, the, the, the things that we covered is just certainly trying to minimize the amount of deep tillage, you know, not flipping the soil. It's certainly, if we want to go technical, uh, I wanted to be more philosophical that I think they already do a good job. Rotation is already something that is critical very very simply keep the soil covered don't farm naked you know basically keep the soil covered eventually hopefully one day say bruno said they will i'll get paid by the amount of days my soil is green and hopefully that could could happen um so the tillage is really the mechanisms that does not allow that allows carbon to be lost you know, immediately. But if you retain, if you keep uh, the jar more closed within the limits of what the vegetables that you're growing, some of them obviously will love carrots, will love onions, will love those are, but they can be done on a smaller scale to be able to uh, still use regenerative type of approaches. So if tillage is, uh, is unavoidable, be able to keep the soil cover and adding organic amendments it's, it's certainly, you know, the way to do it. I think any possibilities of using new technologies, um, I'm not, you know, don't want to do the balance of economics, but eventually one day there will be a uh, possibility of robotics. One thing that really broke my heart uh, during this pandemic, obviously, was seeing these vegetables, people not having food in the supermarket and far fields not be able to be harvested. So that's very sad. California, many... And so eventually there will be uh, technologies is coming and that doesn't mean it's going to fully replace people because they need many, but it, you want to be also more independent from these sorts of threats that we may be witnessing, uh, unfortunately, when more people come, you know, more frequently. So um, technologies be able to collect data on what they learn from the past be able to collect what we call, you know, now this big data, be analyzed and learn and analyze this data with, with the help of uh, a scientist or anyone able to support their decisions because there is a lot of, we always say, if you can understand the past, you can infer about the future. There are changes in the future, but you could predict some of those because some of the things are just frequent, are more frequently repeating, but we have had extreme event in the past. They're just more frequent now. Right. Yeah. And people can learn more about the work you're doing at SIBOTechnologies.com. For one last thing, I mean, being so involved in the modeling carbon credit space, do you see a day not too far ahead where, where any grower, regardless of size, could say, here's what I'm doing. I can sell carbon credits? I think it's a lot closer than you may think, Diego. I, I certainly hope so. 
that's what actually SIBO is pushing for uh, forward is to be able to be able to quantify the regenerative potentials of saying I've done these practices that they can be verified and then we know how much carbon has gone in and it's the, the strength of this is, is but how do you know is also the combination that we talked about is the abatement what are you not emitting by doing certain level of things. And so it's in addition, it's both sequestration as well as reduction in the emissions that needs to be uh, rewarded. Yeah, so start building your soil now so you can uh, maybe get paid for that later. Certainly. Start building your soil. One day, this podcast will say, those guys said it that the future will look more bright because of all this technology coming together. And hopefully, uh, yes, that that time is not too far, but you need to build your carbon in order to stay healthy, keep the soil healthy, produce good quality crop, and be able to maintain this uh, consumer demand of transparency, because I think it, overall the farmers are really honest, genuine, good steward of the environment and the land. And anything that I can do to help in promoting science and information, like accepting the invitation to speak with you today, it's really to, to show off the hard work that they do. But all of what that we have said, it was above the parts. And there is lots of, there is all true to it. You need to build soil carbon and it will pay back. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out some of the great clips and watch the full interviews right here on In Search of Soil.